Tylus, uh, Director of the Humanities Initiative, and it's a real pleasure to welcome everyone here today to our discussion, what you can do with a PhD in the humanities. Um, I'm not going to introduce in any detailed way, or really any detailed way at all, our six wonderful panelists who have agreed to spend the afternoon with us because that's what they're gonna do uh, as they talk about their intellectual journeys and careers and lives um, post-graduate school. Um, and I think their, their tags uh, speak for themselves, but I will go uh, down um, the aisle here, as it were, um, in case you're sitting in the back row and can't read. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, so we have with us today, uh, and you all have on your sheets, um, where they are hailing from and who they are, uh, Lisa Duffy, immediately to my left, followed by Michael Shea, followed by Claire Fowler, followed by Deborah Gaines, uh, followed by David Speedy, followed by Lisa Waller. It looks like you almost basically set in the order of the sheet, which I hadn't figured out. Um, so like I said, their presentations will be introductions of themselves and their illustrious careers. Um, before they start, though, with what will basically be uh, 10 to 15 minute presentations, uh, they'll all speak, then we'll have questions from you, uh, after which point we will break up into six different smaller groups so that you can um, speak to the individual or individuals you would like to talk with more, uh, more closely. Uh, I would like first to just introduce um, are our co-conspirators and colleagues in crime, uh, because this is not something that we did do or wanted to do all by ourselves here at the Humanities Initiative, but this is a very important uh, and for me delightful collaboration with our colleagues in FAS and in the Graduate <coughs> School. So with us here today are Lori Benton, uh, who's the Dean of Humanities, uh, Kathy Talvakia, who is Assistant Dean in the Graduate School, and uh, Mel Semple, who is the Acting Dean and Vice Dean in the Graduate School. And Mel, it'd be wonderful if you could just say a few words to our uh, crew today before we get started with our panelists. Thanks so much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so happy that you decided to come out today. Uh, it's, um, I think, my responsibility to say this is good to see you here. Um, you know, many of us uh, who have spent our lives as uh, faculty and, and I guess administrators in, in, in a university expect our students to follow the path that we chose. And uh, sometimes that's the right choice and sometimes it isn't. I don't know why each of you has chosen to be here today, but uh, I presume that um, you're all looking forward to hearing some new ideas about what the possibilities are outside of the academy. Um, I'm really interested myself, having uh, heard some of these ideas in, in the field of my specialization in science, and uh, um, I'm really interested to hear w w uh, what the opportunities are for, for you looking ahead uh, beyond the academy uh, in the humanities. I think we can all contribute to our discipline in lots of different ways. I'm doing it from in, uh, as a dean, uh, as well as a, as a teacher, um, and your choice might be something um, even more exotic than that. Um, so thanks for coming, and, uh, and I uh, hope to talk to some of you later about uh, your experiences. <coughs> yeah, let me just do that. So um, welcome, everyone. Very glad to see you here. Um, Kathy Talvaki, Assistant Dean of the Graduate School. And uh, I wanted to just briefly say that we are <coughs> thrilled in the Graduate School to partner with the Humanities Initiative. Uh, we've sponsored and worked with them on many programs. Last year we worked, uh, maybe some of you were at the one on uh, grant <coughs> writing. We worked with the uh, Humanities Initiative on that and we consider the Humanities Initiative to be great partners with us <coughs> as we work with you uh, to listen to your concerns and the kinds of programming that would help you in your own professional formation. So thank you for coming, and Jane, thank you for working with us, and we look forward to more collaborations. Well, my name is Lisa Duffy Zavallos. I received my PhD in 2007 from the Institute of Fine Arts. Some of you might not be familiar with the Institute. It is the graduate degree in art history. It's on 78th Street and 5th Avenue, so we're not as connected to NYU downtown. Um, and uh, we had a conference a little bit like this uh, a few months ago about what you can do with a degree in art history, which was very well attended. Um, I'll just start 
by telling you a little bit about my experiences I um, and how I got to the path that I did. I started out as an undergraduate. I didn't do, um, I didn't do work in art history. I did a um, BA in political science, but sort of halfway through I realized that I, I wanted to do art history. That was something that I was well suited for. And I thought, well, vaguely, maybe I want to work at a museum or maybe I want to teach. And so I went to uh, a very specialized program. I went to Arizona State to work on the art of the um, Hispanic Southwest. It seemed like a very targeted program. And when I, I got a master's degree from there and I worked for a little while trying to figure out you know, what the field had. I took a year off between that and my PhD studies and um, worked at the Art Institute of Chicago. I had thought for someone who's an art historian who would go into a museum that I would go into a curatorial department. Um, I actually went into museum education in the teacher uh, programs department in the Art Institute of Chicago. It was a wonderful experience and I got a chance to be connected. I was a transplant. I'd not, I'd, I only lived in Chicago for two years. Um, but it gave me the opportunity to meet people in the community, to meet public high school students, teachers, hear about um, some of the challenges that de they deal with, how to think about the material in new ways to present it to the public, how to present it to um, uh, students and how to get teachers to to teach the material as well so that was very rewarding and one of the things that I think was was one of the biggest wake-up calls for me was that while I was there a number of people who were in the department started leaving to take other positions and when they were replaced they were replaced with people with PhDs a lot of the people in museum and this was museum education had been former teachers and they were wonderful educators but the people who were the department heads, uh, the head of education, the head of teacher programs, the head of student programs, all had PhDs in art history. So I thought as a 25 year old, aha, this is where the, this is where my discipline is going. They're professionalizing a lot of these positions and I know also that a lot of uh, people who had curatorial positions also were being, um, people who had MAs were not being hired as curators as much anymore. They were being replaced by PhDs, or at least new hires who all had PhDs in art history. So I went to the Institute of Fine Arts. Um, I had always intended to, to get a PhD in art history. I missed research. I found out that about myself as well, that I liked education. It was challenging. It was a great opportunity, but I did miss doing my own research. So I went to um, the Institute of Fine Arts and while I was there, I had a few jobs in museums. I worked at, um, this time I did work in a curatorial department. I worked at European Paintings and worked on an exhibition um, of Vermeer that was, that was there with the curator. And it was a wonderful experience. And um, one of the things that I would say is I, I actually got that opportunity through one of my friends, through a colleague who was working also and said, you know, they need someone else. I know you're around. I know you do Baroque, and, and that was my area. And so it was great, and it's one of the things I'd say is, you know, pay attention to your friends and, and you know, keep your ears open and keep your contacts um, with people, you know, among your colleagues because they're going to be your professional colleagues later and you really do help each other um, along the way. Um, I had also thought, well, it's funny because when I first went into art history, a lot of people in Arizona especially said, what are you going to do with that, teach? And I thought, well, well, that's kind of a pejorative just way of talking about teaching in general, but I thought, well, what is there? And I thought, well, art history is not bad because they have museums. Well, it, there, there's actually quite a lot more. Um, and I think I'm pretty lucky to be in a field where there are auction houses, there are galleries, and all of these people, a lot of them have PhDs, even in the professional side, the, the commercial side of the art field. It is a rather fluid back and forth kind of place. You can write a catalog raisonné and be a scholar and work in a gallery. In fact, a lot of those people are very well suited to do that work because they have the archives <coughs> of estates. Um, auction houses, uh, a lot of those people are also working in catalog raisonnés. They're doing really excellent provenance research. They're doing really good art historical research. So, and it does not, the perception was once you left the academy, once you left, if you went into the commercial side, there was no going back. All of a sudden you were tainted with the, the market. It really isn't true anymore. Um, I am in a nonprofit organization. My advisor uh, is on the Art Advisory Council for my organization. It's called IFAR, the International Foundation for Art Research. 
and it was founded in the 60s when there were a lot of fakes and frauds on the market involving prominent collections. And at the time, the, um, the art community and the state attorney general called for an independent body to review authenticity in works of art. We've expanded. Um, so I'm the director of research. I do authenticity research, provenance research. We have a catalog raisonné project. And we've moved into uh, art law and generally ethics in, in the arts field. We've started the first art loss register um, where people could register their lost and stolen works of art. We're less involved in that now. That's an independent organization that we license. But our, our commitment to these issues continues. And like I said, my advisor was on the Art Advisory Council of IFAR, and he knew I wanted a job. He knew I liked research, but didn't necessarily want to go into teaching and recommended me, and I, I've been there for three years. And I just wanted to hold this up, because we also have a journal. I just thought I'd show you with this really ugly Basquiat fake on the cover of it. Um, I wrote an article um, on a, a, an authenticity dispute that's happening um, with a Leonardo. Um, with, I co-wrote it with a lawyer who also works at IFAR. So just to give you an idea of kind of the range of, of um, activities that we do and the kinds of jobs and experiences that, that are out there in my field and how I got there. I should say I've been dreading this for about 15 years, having to uh, explain how I got where I got since it seems to me it belongs in the Journal of Irrepro Irreproducible Results rather than uh, <laughs> giving advice to anyone. Uh, I did my undergraduate work at Cornell and then went to Yale uh, in the humanities at a time when there was a sudden panic uh, in the early 80s that there would suddenly be in, uh, not enough PhDs, not enough uh, university professors in, in the humanities. So there, was, there were new fellowship programs, there were all sorts of new, new uh, initiatives to convince people not to go into banking, but to go into the hu into humanities PhD program in instead. Five years later, six years later, seven years later, you can imagine the job market was, you know, in the pits, and it's hard to know what all the, what all the panic was about, but, but I was in an enormous class at Yale, and there was a tremendous difficulty finding jobs. I was on the job market for something like five years um, without ever quite getting, I think the closest I ever came to a job was actually at NYU toward the end, oddly enough. Uh, so I finished my dissertation. I went and worked for a while in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins at the Medical Center doing humanities programming uh, because there was a sense down there that doctors should be exposed to the humanities, uh, which was sort of run out of the humanities center uh, on, on the Homewood campus. But then began to realize that, you know, academia, the job market was so bad I was probably not going to get a job and, you know, you can't really wait forever once you hit a certain age. So I started looking for, very vaguely looking for jobs in New York. I interviewed for a couple of editorial assistant jobs at publishers, uh, which paid astonishingly little money and probably still do. And then, as it turned out, a friend of mine from Yale was working as an editorial assistant at the New York Review of Books for one of the two editors there. And it turned out that there had been for a long time a kind of Yale spot, which, you know, for, uh, of an editorial assistantship in, uh, at the Review. Um, so I, you know, a job came open and I applied for it and eventually got it. Um, and really basically never looked back, although I, I assume you all know about the New York Review. I should have brought a copy to hold up, but I assume you all have seen it. I'll flatter myself that you have all seen it. But um, I started out as an editorial assistant, uh, answering the phone and opening the mail back when there still was mail, which there isn't now much anymore and, you know, running around chasing down this, that, and the other. And uh, after 17 years, I'm now in a position where I'm doing manuscript editing, doing copy editing, doing not so much photo research anymore, but I've done that along the way, doing production management. Uh, it's a very small editorial staff, uh, sort of happy dysfunctional family or unhappy dysfunctional family or whatever, whatever you want to call it. But uh, it has seemed, uh, in a way, the ideal jump because the, intell the, the intellectual caliber of the review, as you know, is very high. I feel like I'm exposed all the time to, you know, the best writing in, in the humanities, in, in, in law, in philosophy, in the arts, in sciences. Uh, and I very much become, in the course of it, a generalist. I, you know, I did a dissertation in German and, and uh, English romanticism, basically, 
which I've hardly thought about since, but I've <laughs> thought about really everything else you could possibly imagine. So, uh, what are the notes do I have? When I went, I already had a PhD. Uh, they used to hire people, older people, and people with more education to be editorial assistants there. Uh, so, you know, people in the early 30s were opening the mail, as I say, and answering the phone. That's changed somewhat over the years. The, the assistants have gotten younger and younger. They tend to come more out of, straight out of college. But they do often go on to graduate school, either in writing or in the humanities. Uh, so that is certainly a possibility that you can do a stint there and then move on. Um, I just seem to have stayed and stayed and stayed. And I've stayed partly because I think there's not really an obvious place to go having been there. I mean, the review is, is very uh, particular and, and rather unique in its you know, intellectual aspirations. And I'm not sure you know, if there was another magazine that did the same thing. I might think of jumping or I might not. I don't know. But, but um, that's where I am. Claire Fowler and I seem to have fulfilled my parents' worst nightmare that I would never leave college since <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm still in the field of higher education, though, though I'm not a faculty member at Princeton. I'm actually just an administrator, though I actually teach. Um, I was trying to think back into my own, my own time as a graduate student at, at Columbia, and I, I remember you sort of live in a fairly enclosed world where there's one mark of success. There's, you know, the work, the dissertation. The dis dissertation's just a really long paper. Mm -hmm. And my best advice for you would be finish it. It is not your life's work. And if it is your life's work, you're going to be really old by the time you're done with <laughs> it. So, so I think the best advice, the, the most successful graduate student at, in my class at Columbia was um, a working mother of a family of two kids. And she would go to the library every day at 9 o'clock and start work. And she would finish at quarter to five, even if she was in the middle of a sentence. And she wrote her dissertation in one year. So I just <laughs> think about that, you know? <laughs> it's just, and she's like, I just need to be done. OK. So I would say that when, when, I, was in, when I was in graduate school, I, I, I think I lucked out in a way that I got a, a very strange job after I'd been there about three years from a connection with another Columbia graduate student working for, an, believe it or not, for a management consultancy firm in New York, Booz Allen and Hamilton, which I'd never heard of because, of course, we had nothing to do with the business school because we, we were in the arts building. And so this would be in Columbia Graduate School, um, and she had gotten a job in professional development office there, and they needed people to help people edit their reports. And they figured, well, you know, if you go to graduate school, that's one thing you do know how to do is edit reports and write properly, at least one would hope so. So... I ended up getting this job, which led to an incredibly schizophrenic lifestyle in Morningside Heights, where I was you know, barely able to afford to eat one meal in Tom's Diner. Then every three weeks, I'd be flown business class to Singapore to edit some banking <laughs> report that I didn't understand. You know, <laughs> it was a really bizarre life, I have to say. It was also the best thing that ever happened to me, because I absolutely understood I could do a lot of different things. And I, the skills that I had from my little niche market of being a Milton expert and you know knowing everything you could ever possibly want to know about Andrew Marvell and Cromwell which I most of which I've forgotten but still really loved learning about I have to say were transferable into another world and so I know I I learned from these Harvard MBAs who couldn't write but knew more about math and banking than I ever would met tons of people but more importantly understood about myself there were lots of options in this world there were lots of things that I could do so that if I was gonna get a PhD and and be a faculty member or you know stay in higher education it was because I wanted to not because I didn't have other things that I could do and it was tremendously empowering to me. So one piece of advice I would give you is do every other thing that comes your way that's not just about teaching or research. Just really try to figure out what your skills are and go get different kinds of jobs. And frankly, for most of you, I would imagine your academic advisor of your thesis is not the best person to help you with this because they understand a very particular worldview and are really good at it. And so part of your PhD and part of your education is how to become an expert. But the thing is, the world is really made up of generalists. 
And so it's just sort of try to, try to think about that as you, as, and that to pursue your career. I mean, I was in a very, very narrow field. I both loved and hated my dissertation. I think like most people have that kind of a relationship. I love teaching it. I still love 17th century poetry. But I was, I knew about myself, a generalist. I was lucky enough, talking about the job market you talked about, I got the last good job coming out of Columbia University. And I became an assistant professor in the English department at Princeton, which I really liked. But what I really liked was teaching and university life and the exposure to all these possible, um, you know, I, re I like really smart people. You know, I really like being in a place where you can talk about anything from, um, you know, reality TV to Descartes at the same dinner party. And I really like that. And I wanted to stay in that world very much. Um, I arrived in a department that was actually very friendly to me. And I had come from New York City, so people in Princeton are so unbelievably polite. You just can't imagine. So people were very nice. It was a great thing. But, you know, I, I realized, I think, early on that really I wanted to be a reader and not a writer, and that I really loved to read and to, to think, but my idea of my own life, having finished my dissertation, was not to sit in a library for a long time. I'm just not a solitary person, I'm a social person. Then lots of complicated things politically happened in my department, and there was nobody left to do any of the administrative work except for the new kid on the block, which was me. <laughs> so I ended up, you know, being the departmental representative and organizing people's teaching schedules when I was only in my second year teaching, having just finished my dissertation. It was just really kind of, from many people's perspective, an absolute nightmare. For me, it was actually kind of good because I thought, I actually like doing this. I'm pretty good at it. And I still was teaching. And you could tell anybody who here is a very successful academic would realize that I had set myself up not to be this in the fact that in my first two years at Princeton, I taught, you know, not only Milton, but 20th century American women and about 14 other different <laughs> kinds of classes because I really liked to be a generalist and to learn a different, lots of different things. So I came up for my third year review and I was going to have a sabbatical and I took a big risk and I, instead of deciding to write my book because I just really did not want to write my book. It was bad enough writing my dissertation and I certainly didn't want to write my book. So. I persuaded the provost at the time to let me be an intern in the provost's office instead of doing my, my work. So it was great, and I got to go, they were doing strategic planning at the time, so I got to learn how all the different parts of the university worked. And I thought to myself, well, this is just really interesting. What do I like to do? I like to solve problems. I like to write, but preferably things that are not any longer than 10 pages. <laughs> and I like to do research. And I like to work with smart people. And I like to collaborate with people. I get many better ideas working with a bunch of people than working by myself. I always have done. Or as I say, I, you know, I like to think in public and write in private. It's, you know, it's a better way to, to get your ideas done. So I decided I want to be an administrator. And, you know, my dissertation advisor was probably horrified and you know, half my colleagues. But it's what I wanted for, for my life. It was a much more practical life. I still can teach because I have a PhD. That's a, my big theme is finish your dissertation. Actually, I finished my dissertation. The, the, the kind of embarrassing thing is I actually got my job at Princeton having not finished anything close to my dissertation because I wrote the last chapter first. So it looked like I'd really finished my dissertation, but I hadn't. So <laughs> I mean, that wasn't on purpose. It was just sort of the way it worked out. So it just, it just looked a lot better than it was. So, yeah, I know. So, so I had to write it really quickly. So, so that I really, and, you know, and it, was, it was OK, because I'd done a lot of thinking and a lot of research. But, but you do need to finish it. It mustn't be your life's work. It's it just, just do it. You know, just do it to the satisfaction of yourself and your advisor. And then if you're going to be a real academic, then write your book. But don't spend your whole time writing your dissertation. But it's also really good to have finished it, because you've completed something. It shows that you can manage a large project. It's helpful in, in all the ways that it, it, level, it shows a, a level of expertise and commitment to finishing something and to being a professional and someone who meets their obligations. So I would do it for that reason, if nothing else. So here I am now. I, I've been working at Princeton very, um, in various capacities for a long time. Right now I'm in charge of academic advising and undergraduate standing and the residential colleges, which means I 
barely see a student actually, <laughs> unless they're in really big trouble, or, <laughs> or they're the valedictorian. But, uh, but I manage a lot of other people who do. So I get to think about educational policy, how undergraduate education works. I like my job a lot. I have really great smart colleagues. I get to go to lots of interesting lectures and live in a community that is interested in a lot of different things, which is always what I wanted for myself, but I don't actually have to write any books. So <laughs> I'm quite happy about that too. So my advice to you would be really finish the dissertation and take every opportunity that comes your way to be generalists. Because a few of you may become um, academics who will be able to spend the rest of your life teaching your, you know, what you just learned or what you're just interested in. But that happens to very few people, even people who get very successfully placed in the job market and go to different colleges. The first thing they're going to want you to do is teach everything. You know, you, you don't get to teach your dissertation. You don't get to teach unless you're incredibly lucky. And I'm actually sure, not sure it's that lucky, truthfully. But you, you, get to, you get to teach in a very broad way. And then when you're, when, even if you're placed in a, in a, in a, in a an academic community where you're happy, the more, the more you can do, the more useful you're going to be and the more options will be available to you. I hire people to be directors of studies at the residential colleges, which are student advisors. And a lot of those people are people actually who have their PhDs but can't get a job in academia. So it's not always their first choice. For some it is, for some not. Or they've gotten a year's job, but they haven't really been able to get a job where they feel settled and, you know, they feel like I'm 30-something years old. Now I don't want to be living this transient life anymore. I want to do something. So, so I actually talk to a lot of people in that, in that position, and, and I look at their resume and I say, okay, what else have you done? Have you been involved in undergraduate life at all? Have you, what kind of courses have you taught? What sort, of, what sort of opportunities have you taken within the institution that you're in? Have you taught writing courses? Have you helped mentor undergraduates? Have you done, so if you want a broader job in higher education, that's what needs to be on your CV too. So, so, so don't, don't be too, I don't know exactly what the word is. Don't, don't be so, so over-specialized that you don't think about other things that come into your line of work. And, and I think if I hadn't had that job at Booth Allen Hamilton, I wouldn't have realized both to myself, God, actually I can do things that you know, Harvard business people cannot do. <laughs> you know, I can do this. And it gives you a sort of self, sense of self-confidence. It also helped me tremendously on the job market because before I could teach any of these people what to do, the people who were mentoring me in the organization had to teach me how to do public speaking and get up and not make a fool of myself and behave professionally. And so I think it actually helped me when I was interviewing and giving job talks. You don't even, you don't even imagine that at the time. I think life is very serendipitous and each of us as we go along have to make all sorts of choices that affect the work-life balance, who you are, what your personality is. So, so my advice would really be, be open to everything that comes your way as a possible opportunity, even if in the back of your head you might think your advisor is going to think, well, why are they wasting their time doing that? Really, it's, it's anything that develops your skills or a broad base of understanding of the world or what's available to you is a good thing to do. So I would just bear that in mind and good luck finishing the dissertation. <laughs> Hi, my name is Deborah Gaines, and uh, I took Claire's advice and did everything. So I'm going to um, <laughs> very quickly run through that, and I'm also going to bring up what I've been told is a somewhat pornographic term, and that is money. Mm -hmm. um, I started out, I did my undergraduate work at Yale. I went to Columbia in literature, just missed Claire, 17th century British criticism, also not something I've thought about that much uh, in the 30 years since then, but loved it at the time. But uh, I learned a few things about myself during my time at Columbia. One was I didn't really love research. I loved to teach, I loved to learn new things, be around smart people, but sitting in the library researching was agonizing, not to put too fine a point on it to me. Um, I also uh, graduated at a time, or was going to graduate at a time when uh, there were jobs, but they were not in New York or within 2,000 miles of New York. And I had family in New York, and I had other people to consider. 
and I found myself not in a position to take a teaching position in Nebraska for seven years before I could qualify for something in New York. So um, all of these things came together. There was a lot of, you know, there was a dark night of the soul. There was a lot of evaluation. Um, and I did get some good advice at the time, which uh, I'll pass along uh, for what it's worth. One, the first thing I did was evaluate what skills I have that might be transferable to other industries without even knowing what they were. So one, I was smart. I can't uh, overestimate how important this is. Uh, if you're not only smart, but you're confident in your intelligence, you are ahead of 95% of the other people out in the job market. For whatever reason, there's a tremendous amount of insecurity of people going out into the job market. That's where your uh, education, and I've hired a lot of people in this time, and I can tell you this, People always say, what's the difference between the people with the graduate degrees or the people who went to the better schools? The difference I found is they're confident. They're confident they can do different types of work. They're a little more confident in their own intelligence. They're willing to take on things. They may not be at all smarter. They might be stupider, but they're <laughs> willing to take on things that other people might not be willing to take on. So that was actually, as long as you're not arrogant or obnoxious, uh, and you have some basic people skills, I think your intelligence will, will help you. Um, arrogant, not so much. Okay, second, I could write, and I could write uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, I could write in rhymed couplets if I had to, um, I, but I could write anything you needed written, pretty much. Um, I was also not frightened of complex, complex ideas, complex language. I might not understand them, but they didn't terrify me. And I was willing to have the conversation even mostly because I knew so many students, scientists, mathematicians. You know, I was used to engaging in discourse about things I really didn't know that much about. <laughs> and I, I still do a lot of that. And now I get paid a lot for it. Um, <laughs> I also had something which you can evaluate whether or not you have it, but if you do, it's, it's a skill, and that is organizational competence. Um, it, competence, not excellence. Um, I think there's this idea that uh, you have to be very excellent in everything. Showing up on time, um, knowing how to do an outline that makes sense to someone, um, uh, knowing how to recap something that happened in a way that sounds intelligent. All of these things may sound very basic to you, but out in the business world, I did not find them to be basic. So I took those skills and then I went to my contacts, with, which a few other people have mentioned, everyone I ever went to college with. Um, at a certain point in my career, I decided to work in law, in the legal industry. I went through my yearbook and I circled every picture of everyone who I thought was like a bottom-feeding, scum-sucking corporate lawyer. <laughs> and they were. And I called them up and we were 40 then, so they were all on the executive committee. I got two years of six-figure work out of that little exercise. So do not underestimate the value of the contacts that you have. Um, professors, uh, if you feel that you can share the fact that you're considering a different route, your family, whoever. Then I did a lot of informational interviews. I was in New York. That was easy. I knew plenty of people who had gone into all kinds of business, consulting. Um, the most interesting I learned, thing I learned from those interviews was a recognition of or an understanding of differing pay scales within differing organizations. So as a graduate student doing research for a professor, I was, would have been thrilled to get the equivalent of $25 an hour, that same level of research and intelligent organization of research at a major law firm was worth over $200 an hour. This was an interesting piece of information yeah. to me. Um, and this, this is probably, if I have one thing to add to this conversation, um, I suggest that you overcome your fear of money. Um, I think that money and intellectual thought are presented in the academy, not here, I'm sure, but in many parts of the academy as church and state. We don't talk about them. We have the money-grubbing 
people over here. We have the poor but morally and intellectually superior academics over here. Um, and I want to go on record and on video as saying that I think this <laughs> is a self-destructive attitude. Um, I do not think that the fact that you are uh, smart enough to be in these graduate programs and getting a PhD means that you need to be poor for the rest of your life. Um, so with all of those things in mind, um, I tried a few different things. I tried becoming an advertising copywriter. That was extremely interesting. I worked for um, financial services as a copywriter. Uh, this was in the 80s. Uh, my biggest client was a company called uh, Drexel Burnham. And long around 1986, they carted all my bosses away to jail, <laughs> which led me to rethink that career <laughs> path. So I took my ill-gotten gains, which for a 26-year-old were quite extensive, and I went to Italy for two years <laughs> uh, out of this country, <laughs> lived on the beach, and began to string for the New York Post as a travel writer because they weren't willing to pay anything, but I was already there. Was able to spend the four years after that working for the New York Post as a travel writer. No money, that's okay. Uh, traveled all over the world, wrote articles about it. Uh, for a non-married person with no kids, I, I highly recommend that job. Uh, after that, I came back and got a job with the New York Tourist Board because now I had been in what they call the travel industry uh, as the senior publications writer. All of these people were wildly impressed by my education, which was completely irrelevant to anything that I did, but, um, but nevertheless served me, has served me through all of these years. I spent five years working for the New York Tourist Board. Um, and this is another point, I think, instead of limiting yourself to a specific industry or a specific scenario, if you can remain open to anything that will value and reward the skills that you have, all of a sudden you have a much broader universe of places where you can succeed. Um, you know, we used to have this little joke about how I went over to the dark side, right? Well, everyone I know has called me and asked, you know, they figured out that we not only have cookies, we have paychecks. And uh, um, I would also argue, and maybe I'm just, you know, uh, making this weak and feeble argument, but uh, I've learned a lot about a lot of industries. Um, I think my intellect has been firing on all cylinders just because the learning curves are very steep as I try new kinds of work. I'm also working with high-level people in those industries who are not going to suffer fools, which is why um, there's real value in, in your education, no matter where you end up. Many times I haven't had to show samples, I haven't had to show a resume. People say, oh, you did 17th century British literature, really? Wow, I loved John Dryden, and an hour later I have this enormous project. So, um, however, with all of that, at this point, my experience, when I went to write a resume, it looked like something from the Island of Lost Toys. You know, I had like a head and an arm. Um, and <laughs> the way that I've gotten around that is to emphasize my through lines. So everything I've ever done has involved writing, the ability to turn complicated ideas into compelling language, um, and organizational competence. And as I got better and better at organizing, I also discovered that I was good at managing people, um, reaching consensus, bringing teams of people together, uh, bringing in projects on time and on budget, which in many industries is, uh, they can't pay you enough if you have that skill. Uh, so all of these were slowly added to my list. And it's true, I have to walk into an interview now and go through my story a little bit. It's not an easy story to tell in the way of someone who had the same job for 20 years, but uh, people get it, I think. Um, being open to new things. After travel writing, I went in-house at some magazines. I worked at Money Magazine. Um, that was very helpful when I actually had some money because <laughs> I'd read about it. Um, back in the mid-90s, I was asked to come over part-time to be copy chief and then managing editor on a little teeny project that nobody knew anything about 
uh, on a thing called the internet uh, for a company called iVillage. Um, I became managing editor of iVillage and we took that company public uh, in the late 90s, which was a heady experience. And after that, I was hired by Hearst. And remember, my previous in-house job had been as a copy editor at Money Magazine three days a week. Within three years, I was hired at Hearst to run the new media group. Um, so I was building staffs, I was a senior manager. So I'm almost done with this very long story, but then I began to have children. I was at the right age for that. It seemed like a good thing to do. Uh, and I um, decided to go back into consulting. I wanted to have flexibility in my schedule, but I was not in a position uh, to be poor. <laughs> I have three children, and uh, I'm actually a single parent. So, uh, you know, there were a number of different uh, priorities there. However, I now had all of this web background, so I started consulting for companies who needed to do websites. And at first, these included every media company. So from Hearst, I went to Prime Media and Time, and I've probably worked for everyone. And when they all had their websites, um, I started working with law firms and financial services companies. That doesn't seem like a logical jump, but if you think they need someone who is organized and can write in the compelling ideas, manage people, and knows how to launch a website, which now I've been doing for almost 10 years, um, I was able to reposition myself that way. So I actually went in-house at a big law firm in New York, um, which was my real dark side experience. I was promoted and promoted and promoted. I mean, the Peter Principle has never worked the way, I, my career is defined by the Peter Principle. Uh, and I think that you find when you go into an organization, there's a lot of service, there's a lot of work that you can do, there's a lot that you can offer. Uh, and if you value yourself, you can negotiate it in such a way that that work will be valued. Everyone's very happy to let you do it for free, but um, if you show real value to an organization, uh, you don't have to do it for free. And that gets back to the don't be afraid of the money conversation. So at the law firm, by then I had had 20 years of experience of going into some place where I had no idea what was going on, but I was confident that I could probably figure it out. I was not afraid of a learning curve of a new industry. This was an industry that was dripping with money. And so I was promoted three or four times until I was um, global chief marketing officer uh, of this 1600 person law firm which was pretty good for a copy editor for money. Uh, but again, I also have, and this is another question you need to ask yourself, what's your appetite for risk? What is your appetite for risk and how flexible, you know, how many cliffs are you going to jump off? I would think I'm at the extreme of people who s never saw a cliff I didn't jump off. Um, I think you may fall anywhere in this spectrum, wherever is comfortable for you is fine. Um, but for me, uh, at this point, I felt confident that, uh, you know, uh, we weren't going to be sleeping in a box down by the train station. I went back into consulting, uh, left the law firm uh, in 2007. So this was three years ago and went back into consulting. And I've, since then, I've worked primarily for other law firms and financial services companies, but through a very strange uh, recent confluence of events, I've started to work for a university on a large project overhauling their website and communications and I guess we don't call it marketing. Um, uh, <laughs> you know. So our, uh, their uh, advancement, we don't call it development anymore either, right? Our advancement and communications functions um, because once again, this same set of let's call them now five skills, writing, uh, uh, whatever the other ones were. <laughs> writing, translating material, reaching consensus, managing people, not being afraid of money, right, um, are now coming to bear uh, in working on a university project. So I just started um, uh, overhauling a website and I've been at this project for less than a month, and you know they're discussing possible job offers, which, you know, I don't think we're there yet. But I guess the point is that um, there is a place for me, 
and there's a place for all of you. Uh, yes, the economy figures into it. I think when the economy is low, it's going to require more flexibility and it's going to require more creative thinking, which is something that I think you are all probably very adept at. Um, but in any economy, I believe, in, you know, incredibly considered, there's a market for intelligent analysis, uh, organizational competence, writing skills, um, uh, people with the skills that you've developed here. The only advice I would want to leave you with is don't undersell yourself when you go out into that market. For two reasons. One, you'll be poor. That will be sad. People will take advantage. Number two, you will be perceived as a lower level person. I have had people who, uh, Columbia graduate students finishing their dissertations coming to me and begging me to work for $20 an hour. That's a mistake. I'm more likely to hire you to work for $100 an hour, and I will. So, and so will a lot of other people. So value yourselves, value what you've done, um, uh, and be willing to take some chances. I guess that would be my advice. Good luck. I'm David Speedy. Uh, I'd like to thank Jane Tylus and her colleagues for inviting me to be part of this uh, increasingly interesting panel. And uh, uh, it, it sounds like it's kind of a, 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 a series of horn-locking contests as to who took the most convoluted route to where they are. Uh, I thought I was re really way ahead, but after listening to my neighbor, I'm not so sure. Uh, but, but anyway, uh, here we go. I'm, I'm, my f uh, academic background is I have an MA Honours degree in MLIT from the University of St Andrews in Scotland uh, in medieval language and literature. Uh, I then came as a Kennedy Fellow uh, to Harvard um, and held that for, for, for one year. But th the journey has been indeed convoluted, so fasten your seatbelts. Um, I began at age 25. I, I graduated from St. Andrews and, and took immediately a job while working for my research degree teaching in, in, the, the, in Anglo-Saxon and Middle English. So I know all about Dark Nights of the Soul they were, um, as a medievalist. Um, so I found myself at age 25 in a very secure but confined position in a very nice ta uh, town and, and, and prestigious university. Um, I'd been to one overseas or one foreign country, England, um, <laughs> which is still the most foreign country for most Scots, by the way, as you probably know. Uh, and so at, at basically at age 25, I applied for uh, a fellowship to Harvard, gave up a tenured academic position, which is probably where I lead most of my audience uh, at this point. Uh, but I did. Um, and that then led to a, a roller coaster ride that involved uh, uh, thereafter a brief encounter with diplomatic life at the Bu British Embassy in Washington. Uh, a series of positions in arts and cultural administration ranging from working with an international festival to being commissioner of culture for a large city, an invitation to go help up set up a consulting firm, uh, consulting for the nonprofits, uh, and then into the foundation world to develop new programs in arts and, and public policy that of course one year later became heading up a program and reducing the nuclear weapons threat. Uh, so, as you can see, truly a linear progression. But from there, there was, uh, you'll be glad to know, uh, a 20-year period of some stability of uh, working uh, first in philanthropy and then with, now with a think tank that's concerned with uh, ethics and the formulation of foreign policy. And I do have some propaganda, which I'll be happy to share afterwards. Uh, but basically, it's been foreign policy for 20 years. Oh, I, I, no, I did forget to mention I was president of a contemporary art museum for one year in the middle of that, just to take a break or two. I didn't live on a beach, but I, I did work uh, at, a, at, a, at a coastal city. So this picaresque adventure has taken me to, from, from uh, a wee town in Scotland to uh, Boston, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, North Carolina, Virginia, Florida, and oh, and now New York City, of course. So in summary, I guess one way of advising you uh, uh, as you think of your own career paths is sort of a paraphrase of the signature Sinatra song, Don't Do It My Way, uh, at least not without significant impacts on societal and family affairs. 
Um, actually, it's had a lot of advantages, and I, and I want to come back to that briefly later. But I do want to take a, just a couple of minutes to focus on one major strand of this career that has, in my opinion, distinct relevance to humanities training and, and to the topic of the session, what you can do with, with a humanities degree. And that's the, the time I've spent in philanthropy, which has been most of my last 20 years, the work, of course, of charitable foundations. The core pragmatic question of this session is what can you do with a PhD in the humanities? Now, I, I don't know about fellow panelists, but I'm not sure I can answer that question very faithfully um, from, my, uh, from my own background and trajectory. I feel that I'm certainly in no position even to, to, to address what will you do with a PhD in, in the, what will you do with a PhD in the humanities. I know when I graduated from St. Andrews many moons ago, and this was back in the days, by the way, I should have mentioned that um, part of my choice was that, that I was pretty much uh, there for life. We, we were re rejoicing in the prime ministership of a, a dragon lady called Margaret Thatcher, who decided that the best thing to do was to truncate universities and higher education uh, in, in, in general, and the humanities in particular. The humanities were insidious, were devious. Were, were, were subversive, uh, even medieval English apparently. So, so that was part of the, the choice to leave. But I, I do remember um, that at graduation we'd have these, uh, you know, companies would come, corporations, government offices, the foreign office, um, uh, and others would come and talk to students and they would actually seek out graduates in, in, in the humanities, in the classics, in philosophy, in history, even in English, uh, because they wanted people with a capacious, probing mind who had had a, this general education. I, did, I, I don't have time to quote this, but I did bring Newman's On the Scope and Nature of University Education, which is an ancient work, but well worth reading uh, for anyone, any humanities graduate, and what, they, uh, what, what both the opportunities and the strengths are. Um, I'm sure that has changed. Uh, you know, now there are professional schools. We didn't have a business school at St. Andrews. We didn't have a journalism school. So I'm sure that has changed. But I think there is still that role uh, for, for the, 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 the bigger outside world. However, when I asked the corollary question to the main one, what can you do with a PhD in the humanities? When I asked the corollary question, where can humanities or liberal arts training be applied to great advantage, then I, I would make the case for philanthropy. Um, first, a very brief word about the field. Uh, uh, this is taken from an essay I wrote uh, on, on this, so I'll, I'll just quote from it. Foundations are uniquely privileged institutions. They are endowed in perpetuity unless they decide to spend down their assets over a defined limited period of grant making. They don't have to engage in public relations or in marketing themselves to any customer. On the contrary, the customer, the grant seeker, which many of you will become <laughs> in the course of time, the grant seeker has to market herself to the foundation. They do not, by definition, have to show a profit. Uh, and they're only financially responsible in the sense of IRS reporting, <laughs> uh, which some of them do better than others, but that's another question. Uh, and they cannot be voted out of office by any electorate, shareholder, or indeed any constituency. In other words, um, in many ways, it's a pretty good place to work. And many people are interested in philanthropy for that reason. Um, but in less pragmatic terms, getting beyond the, the filthy looker that my neighbor seemed to harp on quite a bit, actually. Mm -hmm. And it bothered you. It, it did. <laughs> I was feeling a lot more secure before she spoke. <laughs> in less pragmatic terms, there is an ethos inherent in philanthropy that is very consistent with humanities training. Foundations at their best, and I emphasize at their best, are creative in conception and purpose. They work in the realm of ideas. They push the envelope, to use the jargon, of exploring new territory. They are, or they ought to be, risk takers. In other words, they can think long term, strategically, on big societal issues that the humanities is all about, 
as far as I can see. For this, it seems to me, for this reason, it seems to me the humanities graduate is very well prepared to think broadly, to offer critical analysis of proposed work that a foundation is looking at, to relate to a project in a broader context, how it impacts society. This gets in, by the way, to the whole question of hiring generalists versus specialists. And, and like some people before me, I'm a great advocate in, in philanthropy of the generalist over the specialist for reasons that I, I don't want to, I'll, I'll be happy to get into in Q&A, but the role of the generalist in thinking broadly for a, a philanthropic purpose is, is indispensable. Uh, again, in q and I'll be very happy to get into whether foundations are living up in general to their mission. That's a, a fraught question and one that I take up in, in this essay. Um, a few words of advice, uh, and, and I hope my, uh, my predecessors didn't come across too much of the sort of commencement inspirational speech uh, that seems to read about the same every year when you, when you hear about it. So this is not a commencement speech encouragement, but... Um, in terms of, of what I have done, uh, and, and much, by the way, much of what I've just said about philanthropy is also applicable to the think tank, uh, where I work. Uh, it's, it's the opportunity to think broadly, to, to probe deeply at the same time, um, to try and advance knowledge of arcane issues, uh, and, and that is, is tremendously rewarding. The, uh, the, the ability to, be, uh, to do some independent writing um, and, and most of it is actually of the 10 page and below variety, so it's agreeable for that reason too. But in terms of getting into the, the policy world, and, and I'm specifically in the foreign policy world, um, know what you want and find something that you really have a passion for. And if there are any English drama majors here, you may remember the, the line in, in John Osborne's Look Back in Anger when Jimmy Porter says, there are no great causes anymore. Well, of course, there are great causes, whether it's save the whales or climate change or reducing the nuclear threat or energy alternatives. These are all incredibly important uh, current issues. And, and it really does, I, 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 I hope I'm not betraying age here, but it really does bother me that the, the public jadedness and lack of interest in some of these it comes across in the public discourse, and I think that's, it's incumbent on people like you to take on these issues and make sure that they're not relegated to the, the pages of, of, of professional academic journals. They're much more important than that from a, a policy point of view. Secondly, network. Seek out professional organizations and contacts in the realm of what you feel passionate about, whether it be Save the Whales or, or reducing nuclear threat. Be a joiner. Um, remember, and most of you are not likely uh, to be a, a, a CPA or a dentist, so you won't have a, an annual convention of 50,000 dentists to go to once every year. You know, seek out organizations. That, that there are many in New York, uh, whether they be think tanks or large and small that, uh, that you could be involved with. Uh, be flexible. I didn't really, I hope, I hope there's no one here from North Carolina. I actually like North Carolina now, but I wasn't ready to move there uh, from Philadelphia. I worked for a mayor who decided not to run for a second term um, for reasons best known to himself, so I, I had to resign. I was going to get fired. Um, and the opportunity came up to move to a consulting firm that happened to be based, a wealthy individual who wanted to help nonprofits in management, marketing, and fundraising, based in North Carolina. So. I take my wife and six-year-old son, who didn't speak to me for two months, um, to North Carolina. Uh, so be flexible. Also, I, I will also add that when, when, I was, when I first went to Harvard in the, in the 1970s, that was the first time I remember when the graduates uh, in the English department, uh, PhD graduates at Harvard, could not pick and choose where they were going to go. So they, some of them went to Nebraska or even further afield, so be flexible. Um, related to that, <coughs> and I think this has come across not just from me, but from others who, who have spoken, uh, expect the unexpected. I've had 10 jobs, oh, 10 jobs since leaving St. Andrews, and I applied for one. The rest were to use, I think my neighbor's term, serendipitous. So look for serendipity and expect the unexpected. Um, 
you know, I said in the beginning, don't do it my way, but, but I'm only semi-serious. The great medieval scholar Barbara Tuchman once wrote that medieval studies prepare one for just about anything in life. And that may sound a wee bit self-serving coming from a medievalist, but, uh, but it really I is true. Um, uh, quite apart from the dark night of the soul, which is a medieval coinage, um, you know, and getting technical for just a moment, from the debate literature in medieval studies to religious allegory and so on, to the question of ethical values of the essence of epic literature, all of these things are, are incredibly valuable to me as I now look at the, 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 the world, the fraught, fractious world of, of 21st century foreign policy. Uh, the journey that I described in the beginning has been daunting, has been disconcerting at times, has been certainly socially dislocating. But to use the contemporary jargon has been a, a lifelong learning process. And you know better than anyone else that learning is fun. So <laughs> let, me, let me just take a, one moment. To, this occurred to me actually on the subway coming down here, and I think it's, it's really interesting. <clears throat> About two weeks ago at our office, at our organization, the Carnegie Council, and by the way, like as today, we, everything we do is on... on is recorded. So this session you can check out on our website, which I will be promoting in just a, a few minutes. We welcomed uh, someone that my colleagues may know, Lisa Anderson, who was at one time the head of the School of International Public Affairs at uh, Columbia, and is now the president of the American University of Cairo. And Lisa spoke, obviously, uh, the university, AUC, American University of Cairo, is located on Tahrir Square, which is seared into our consciousness as the epicenter of the uprising and the, the revolution that took place in, in Egypt just a few weeks ago. Um, and she spoke with great eloquence. I mean, not only were students and faculty, as you might expect, involved in the demonstrations, uh, t students and faculty taking part in the demonstrations. But they also participated centrally in the negotiations that resulted in the change of, of, of government, essentially, in Egypt, the resignation of the president, President Mubarak. They organized debates on the future of the country, uh, organized by the university, but for a larger public. They wrote papers on governance, model electoral systems, inclusion of ethnic and religious minorities, rural communities, bringing more people into the, 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 the polity, as it were. Um, and there are four members of the AUC staff who are a part of the interim government uh, in Egypt. And so I think the important thing to take away there is that here you have a liberal arts, humanities, dedicated academic institution that has had a key role in framing and shaping the future of his country. Um, there's an old Chinese expression, may we live in interesting times. Um, most of us probably will not live in such interesting times as happened in Egypt a few weeks ago, but I think the example of AUC is at least something of a, an inspiration and bold thinking of uh, what humanities specialists can do. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I, too, want to thank Dr. Tylus for having me here, and I want to thank you, graduate students. Um, this moment is a bit reminiscent of the commencement speech. Each year, I have the pleasure of giving the commencement address at my school. I'm always the last person to speak. I confer the diplomas, and then the kids take off for the rest of their lives, and I know that I'm the only thing standing between you and running off to finish that dissertation, so <laughs> I'm going to try to... Um, I'm going to try to get a move on here. Um, I earned my PhD from Duke University in history in 1998. Um, and my research and dissertation were on the New York City public school desegregation movement, uh, which I found completely compelling. And one thing that I realized, even in the moment of researching and writing, is how important it is to choose your topic well. Now, of course, when you're well on the way, uh, that could be water under the bridge and you stick with your topic, whatever it happens to be. But I do think that um, I chose well in the sense that I would often sit um, with my husband and actually um, cast my dissertation, you know, who would be in the movie of the New York City school desegregation <laughs> battle. Um, so I really was uh, quite gripped by it and enjoyed it very much and think that in one way it really does relate to the path that I took. 
<laughs> so as my biographical statement indicates, I am the director of the high school at the Dalton School. Dalton is a K through 12 co-educational independent school here in New York City on the Upper East Side. Um, I've been the head of the division for six years and prior to that held the post of assistant to the head of school for academic affairs. I was also the director of admissions, or I'm sorry, the associate, I promoted myself, I was the associate director of admissions, K through 12. That's right, why not? Who can stop me? I think this is being filmed though. Um, and, um, <laughs> I was, I've also been on the faculty at Dalton and in some my time at Dalton um, has lasted for 16 years. So the question, how did I get here? This is a question that I often ponder. Um, I looked at my calendar in terms of thinking about this question and I, I looked at a typical day and in that day I had a meeting with three parents, separate parents. I had a meeting with the chairman of the English department, a meeting with an architecture teacher and an art teacher who wanted to take kids to the Dalton School in The Hague, a meeting with two 11th grade students with whom I regularly discuss progressive education, um, and I also had to present a new assessments calendar to the entire faculty, some of whom were thrilled to see it come to fruit and others who want it to be left alone. Um, and this is in one day and doesn't include the meetings that I had in the elevator. And literally at one point, not on this day, but once um, in my tenure, I had someone say to me, I'll come with you to the bathroom <laughs> so that we can talk about this. And when you are in the stall, <laughs> listening to someone talk to you. You ask yourself, how did I get here? <laughs> how did I get here? And so I appreciate parsing this question with a, with a different hat on. Um, I think the short answer is that I came to this work because of my passion for learning and for teaching. And whenever I'm honored with the opportunity to talk about my career path, I feel that I always have to sort of pay my debt to the people who shepherded me this far. You know, I think about the educators in my family. I think about the teachers who nurtured me when I was in public school and in parochial school as a little girl, the Jesuits and lay teachers who um, shepherded me through a very rigorous prep school, and uh, the faculty and administrators at Oberlin College who I found to be the most remarkable people in the world. I think these people really set in me a desire to make a life in education, and that path was in one way, I think fairly direct, though perhaps not predictable in terms of some of the choices that I made, and so I'll tell you a bit about that. I was a double major at Oberlin. I majored in English and also in African American and African Studies, which at that time was called Black Studies. And it was through my connection to Black Studies that I attended one of my first academic conferences, and this was incredibly exciting to me, having all of these people sitting and parsing the scholarship and responding to the talks and all of this. I was just thrilled and, and I think I participated fairly heavily because a fellow came up to me after one of the sessions and said, you know, you should really think about becoming a teacher. And I said to him, you know, this is something that is interesting to me. I certainly had my share of stuffed animals lined up saying, well, oh no, Teddy, that is not the right answer, but what were you sort of going for there? You know, so I definitely had mocked out that experience of throughout my young years. This fellow was called Mark Hilgendorf, and he was incredibly inspirational to me. He suggested that I consider teaching at his school, Milton Academy, which is the south of Boston. And as it happened, I had a dear friend at Oberlin who had attended Milton, and as it turned out, he had been Dr. Hilgendorf's student. And so again, the serendipity, something in that felt right to me. And I said, you know, I think I'm gonna go for that job. And I went and applied for it and um, won the job and happily won it in my junior year so that I had a lovely senior year at Oberlin, um, not wondering what was going to happen next. And that was really exciting for me. So I started teaching there in 1987-88. Um, Milton was amazing. It was all in from the very beginning. Their idea was get into the classroom and start teaching people. There was no testing the waters. I was in the deep end, but I really loved it. Um, I worked in the summer at Milton in a program that was designed for public school students who were being encouraged to attend college. And then during the regular school year, worked with the kids who were in the academy. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. It was like, I was like, they are paying me to do this. They are paying me to come up with these lesson plans and to plan these seminars and to talk to the parents and to live in the dorms and the whole thing. I was completely gripped. I taught um, eighth graders in the English department and I taught 12th graders um, African American history. And these 12th graders, I was talking to my colleagues on the panel earlier, I believe I was 21 when I started there and my students in the 12th grade were about 18. So <laughs> I was desperately trying to put up the firewall and pretend to be a real teacher and I think it, it worked out fairly well in the end. Um, I 
think that one of the things that really mattered for me at Milton was that I had strong mentorship. There were people there who believed in me, who gave me opportunities that looking at it now as a school administrator are a little scary. Putting me in the classroom and saying, I know you can do it. You know, you have a great degree from a great school. You'll be fine. Um, I think that kind of risk taking is important for people who hire. And I try to keep that in my mind when I'm hiring faculty members at Dalton now. And I very much appreciated that people gave me that shot, gave me the opportunity to feel really capable, to feel that I could really do this thing. I was also a um, dorm mother. Oh, yeah. To uh, <laughs> watched Ferris Bueller's Day Off about 200 times during my two years at Milton. But um, also, you really had to learn how to respond to the hijinks of these kids, to um, consult with them, to tell them when no was no, to talk to them about how they were relating to their parents. And I do think that that skill of working with people um, is something that I'm called to, to employ every single hour of every day in my work now. And I think I really was steeped in that. Um, in that dorm duty job. I also lived in the infirmary. I was willing to do almost anything. And um, I had to regularly wake up every four hours to administer Tylenol to the children who happened to be in the infirmary, carrying a beeper, which will age me a little bit. Um, at the time, I didn't think I enjoyed that, but I actually think even that was exciting to me. I felt very much a part of a community, uh, very well taken care of in this boarding school environment, and um, really felt necessary to give that Tylenol, to teach those kids all about the English and the history, to do the whole thing. That was very exciting for me. Um, working with Mark Hilgendorf was really uh, tremendous. He was truly a scholar and brought the kind of expectation that you have for students, um, a strong expectation that they will think and think hard, that they will read and read well. He brought that to his classroom. It was something that I recognized from my own education and something that I really wanted to emulate. And I do think in one way, so many teachers and professors are either attempting to be people who they cherished in their own educational experiences or desperately trying not to be those people. You know, you're sort of working on either end or the other. Um, working with Mark made me realize that I wanted to go to graduate school, that I wanted to know more. And it's interesting because I, I do recall someone saying to me, basically, why would you waste your time pursuing the PhD if you think you're only going to teach high school. And I thought to myself, well, I wonder what kind of high school education you got that you believe that teachers should actually limit themselves in this way. I want to know because I want to know. I want to study because I want to study. And I want to bring that to my kids. And that's important for the kids who I teach who are in eighth grade. It's important for the kids in 12th. And I think it's important for all of us. And so I decided to venture out into the PhD world to go to graduate school. And I settled on Duke University. Um, I'd like to say that most of this had to do with me researching the opportunities, and I did do that. I wanted a department with depth. I didn't want one professor who, you know, I might fall out with and then find myself at sea. I wanted to be in a place where there were many people who were interested in my field. But I will also say that my dearest friend and partner in crime was at Duke, and I, it, I thought, why not? Why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I go and mess around with her in North Carolina? And so I went um, and loved it. I think that um, for me, interestingly enough, Mark Hilgendorf, my first mentor at Milton, had also attended Duke and had taken his PhD in the history department there. And again, in terms of those weird coincidences and connections, that too meant something to me. I was like, hmm, I think I'm on the right path here. Um, at Duke, I had the benefit of young scholars like myself who were tremendously passionate. Um, my friend and I helped to form a group where there were scholars from different fields working together so that we weren't just in our isolated little history moment. And I think that's important too, just because that helps you to see beyond. And in graduate school, sometimes you barely get outside of the realm of people who are in your immediate field. And I think those connections were important. I was also in a gigging band when I was in graduate school, and that too gave me a whole different way of thinking about my life. My friend, who will go on name but is in the room, is pointing out that she too was in that band. Um, we, were, we were in that band together. We earned good money. Um, we had a great time, won the battle of the bands. People were saying free bird and doing the lighters, you know. It was terrific. We felt really capable in a whole nother realm. And it's really important when you walk into, you know, a fraternity house for the Battle of the Bands, and you're playing Central African pop music, and everyone else has got this easy top beard, you have to figure out how to command that audience, how to take those people on. 
and get them up on the stage dancing with you. And we did that. So that too was critical to me in terms of thinking about how you interact with people in a room, how you make a connection with people who you don't know. And again, that too ended up serving me in my work. Um, you know, I had some trepidation about North Carolina too. Loved working with my professor, William Chafe, who was just the most supportive guy in the world. And also, you know, a bon vivant, he had a good time in the academy. He loved his work and it really showed. And I think um, having that connection with him was important because I knew that he would be supportive of whatever I decided to do. And what I decided after two years in North Carolina was to leave North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I gotta get out of here. Um, I knew that my research topic would be a New York City topic and I left, which was something that um, anyone who had done their residency in terms of the coursework could have done. But many people said to me, what, you're gonna, you're gonna like take off? What about, you know, you're supposed to be here? And I thought, you know, I think I can do this from afar. And I would fly in when I could to talk to people, but I decided that I needed to be in New York um, and was supported in, in, in coming here. Now, it won't surprise you that my fellowship that had me living high off the hog in North Carolina <laughs> could barely sustain me um, when I got here to New York City. And so I realized I was gonna have to get some work and through a friend um, came into a job at the National Audubon Society working in their library. What had happened is um, Audubon is licensed to a number of different companies and there was a little calendar company that had, you know, the, I don't know, yellow breasted crocodoodle on its calendar. And the key is that you're not allowed to put any contact information because Audubon didn't have the staff to respond to queries. This calendar company said, you know, if you have any questions, contact the National Audubon Society in New York City people started doing that by the hundreds and so they had to hire me to respond <laughs> to these queries. So mistakes can help you in your career as well. Um, so I responded to these random queries from people who had bought this calendar and um, I guess I did a good job of that because they asked me to consider helping them to research and bring to press a book called Audubon House that was really the chronicling of Audubon's transition from their headquarters in Midtown Manhattan to a green building um, down here in the village in the Shimmerhorn building. And this was really um, on the forefront of US green agriculture. So this people, I mean, not agriculture, architecture, people were really excited about this building. It was an amazing space within which to work, but they needed someone who had the ability essentially to chart all of the material used in this building to understand its provenance, to uh, properly cite that in the book, et cetera, et cetera. And they asked if I would do this, and it certainly played to the skills that I developed in graduate school, and I agreed to do it. Um, loved working with these folks because I had not known much about the environmental movement prior to this work, and to see their passion, and also to live in this space that was a manifestation of the passion was really exciting for me. But um, I felt that call, you know, I wanted to get back to the teaching. I felt that I had to, to move on. And so after a few years at Audubon, um, I applied for and won a fellowship, five colleges fellowship, to write the dissertation and teach at Amherst College, and off I tramped to Amherst. Um, it, that was a very lonely time for me. I didn't know anyone in Amherst, Massachusetts, and when you don't know anyone in Amherst, Massachusetts, you're lonely. I remember once walking into the history department office and the assistant was out sick and I burst into tears. I was like, oh my God. I, I was like, I only use my voice when she's here. Um, so it was really a lonely time, just me and David Letterman. Um, but I did have my students who I, I very much enjoyed, but I taught once a week. So I didn't have that sustaining sense of relationships and found myself actually traveling back and forth to New York City. Um, you know, my husband was here, my friends were here and I was really kind of commuting by bus from Amherst to New York uh, multiple times a week, but I felt I had to do it that way in order to, to make this thing work out for me. Um, during one of these journeys um, to New York, I learned of an opportunity at the Dalton School, and I had not heard of Dalton, I'm ashamed to say now, but um, I had heard that it was a really great place to work, and the fellow who was talking to me about this, I'd met at a party, we were at this party, and he said, oh my God, you know, you should consider being a teacher, and I had heard that before, you'll recall, before I started at Milton, and I said, well, you know, I, I think of myself as a, as a teacher, I mean, I'm a graduate student right now, but that's, that's who I am, and he suggested that I apply for a job at Dalton. Now, I think this was the critical juncture for me, because I knew, I knew that if I took that, do that job at Dalton, that was kind of where I was going. Um, and I definitely perceived the pressure in graduate school 
to go for the professorship. That really was what it was all about um, in, in our graduate school at that time. And I think I really benefited from having taught at Milton before beginning the PhD program so that I knew a whole nother life. I'm having done that research at Audubon, so I knew tons of PhDs who were doing other things and doing them successfully and happily. And I think that um, made me free. It's like I, I went to Catholic school as a kid and um, I was not raised Catholic. And there was a kind of freedom in that because I could take all the good, but I wasn't worried about that other stuff. <laughs> I was like, it's like, that's you people. Um, yeah. And so when I was in graduate school, you know, I, I really enjoyed all the work that we did. And I, I think I actually fed on the desire of my colleagues to be a part of the professoriate, but I wasn't captured by it. I knew that I could do something else, and that meant quite a lot to me. And so I said, yeah, I'm going to do this thing at, at um, Dalton. If I get this job, I'm going to stick with this. Um, I started in the history department at Dalton in 1995. I was working part-time, allegedly. There's no such thing as a part-time job, so that's the first thing I want to say to you all. No such thing. If you're ambitious, if you're thorough, it's not going to be part-time. And so I found myself at Dalton all the time, but I had colleagues in the department who really pushed me, and they'd say, aren't you meant to be doing your research? You've got to go. You've got to stop talking to these kids. You've got to go. And so again, supportive people around you mean a tremendous amount as you're trying to, to sort of find your way. The chairman of the department at Dalton was himself um, a PhD, and he had done his work on Franz Boas. He read my entire dissertation, and I was really glad that he did, because many of the things that we talked about actually came up during my committee. And I thought, my god, you know, because I wasn't down at Duke, I didn't have that same communion that I might have had. But he really was that for me. And the environment at Dalton is very much an environment of scholarship. He, was, he's the mo he is more current in the literature than anyone I know. This is what he does. And so it is with many people in the department. And so there was a real sense to me um, Dalton used to be called the Children's University School, and, and there was a sense in me that that is, in fact, what this was, and so I'd be able to have my cake and eat it, too. I like working with adolescents. I, I like the openness that they bring. I like it that half the time they are small children, and the other half, you feel that you could seat the reins to them and walk out, and the school would be fine. That tension is really exciting to me. Um, having the scholarship superimposed over that you know, I was like, there's, there's nothing better than this. And so I decided that I would indeed um, stay there. Earned uh, the PhD in 1998, along with two other friends who got their doctorates that year, and recall with real pleasure being uh, celebrated by the students at the school. Um, the head of school announced this to everyone, and all the kids are screaming, oh my god, you know, Doc Waller, oh. <laughs> um, you know, so that there was a real sense of community and support right the way through. Um, I have always been um, an enthusiastic supporter of Dalton, and I think this, combined with my success in uh, a lot of outreach events and bringing families to the school, led to me becoming the Associate Director of Admissions. I had been doing that work essentially on a volunteer basis, um, but it, it seemed to be becoming increasingly critical in the life of the school. I needed to be at everything. They needed me to speak all the time, and I um, took a step that was not typical of me and, and said, listen, if I'm doing this all the time, it strikes me that it's my job. So why don't we say it's my job and pay me to do it and give me a title that indicates that this is my job? And everyone was very supportive of that, um, allowing me to, to be uh, associate director of admissions kindergarten through 12th grade. Incredibly exciting work. Um, we were able to do a lot in terms of diversifying the population of the school. Dalton had done very well in terms of having um, families of color um, but I really wanted to be sure that there were families of color that were diverse within themselves, socioeconomically and in terms of their backgrounds, and we did uh, great work in that regard. Um, if a bit into that work, the school came up for its accreditation. The National um, or the New York State Association of Independent Schools requires independent schools that are members to be accredited every 10 years. And this is a huge undertaking. This is the moment when everyone puts their finger to their nose and says, not me, because it requires a tremendous amount of research, writing, organizing committees, and organizing people so that you can uh, demonstrate for the visitors who will come that your school is matching mission from kindergarten to 12th grade from the physical plant 
and the lunches to athletics in the academic programs. It's a huge undertaking. But having worked on the dissertation, I felt very capable of doing that research internally and producing that document and helping others to produce their parts of it. And so I decided to take it on. Um, I think it was critical for me in terms of learning everything that I could about the entire school. I came to understand what the Board of Trustees actually does. I came to understand um, why you have to have a certain amount of space in a kindergarten classroom or otherwise the state will shut you down. These things were, who am I, a weird person. These things were exciting to me. I was like, oh, I love this. I want to know more about this. Um, that work, I think, let people at the school see my interest and my passion. And I was put on the central administrative team of the school where I learned even more about the functioning of the school. And all of this then culminated um, in 2004 with my decision to apply for the directorship of the high school. This was a very difficult decision for me. I could have sat pat with the admissions work. I always joke that admissions work is like dating. Everyone wants to make a good impression. So can I get more for you? Can I, can I hold the door for you? Can I pull out your chair? Whereas running a high school is like being at your family reunion. <laughs> so you have the people who are like, can I get you more? And you have your crazy Uncle Cranky who has been driving you crazy your entire life. It's the whole thing. It's the full package. Um, and I thought to myself, why would I give up dating to go to my family reunion with your crazy Uncle Cranky over and over again? But I knew that this was a moment that required courage. The head of our school often says, you know, you only regret the things that you don't try. And I thought, this will allow me to work with faculty and students in a way that plays to everything that I believe about education, things that I believed from researching that dissertation, things that I believed in terms of my own educational experience. And it was scary, because you know, you're in a successful post, there will be many families coming as far as we can tell into the distant future to come to the school and everyone makes everyone feel happy. I was like, that's a great gig. This other thing struck me as tremendous um, and perhaps uh, something that I should steer away from, but I was encouraged by so many people. I knew that the only reason that I was hesitating was because I was choking a little bit and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go for that job. And I did and happily um, I was granted this position. It has been um, an incredible journey for me, incredible work. Um, there are things about this job that I think seem counter to the experience of rumination that I associate with, with graduate school. You know, what do we do, Lisa? There's a journalist at our door who's trying to get in here and interview us about our kids because something happened. What do we do? The Model UN team is going to take the bus to DC, but there may be a snowstorm, but they're not saying there's going to be a snowstorm and the kids have been working on it and the parents really want them to go, but the parents won't be happy if something happens. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And I'm meant to answer these questions all the time. There are some nights when I go out to dinner and they say, you know, where would you like to sit? And I'm like, I'm not deciding. I am not deciding. You're deciding where I'd like to sit because I'm not making any more decisions. You know, so there's this constant sort of go, go, go that is um, in one way antithetical to graduate school. But I feel that the, um, in one way, but I feel that really um, the habits of mind that I developed in pursuing the PhD um, are critical both in these sort of high stakes, time sensitive decision making moments, but also as I try to think about the long range planning of our school. You know, inquiry and analysis, collaboration, discourse, the ability to interrogate your own work. These things are critical. Um, I'm well paid to do it, but I'm also um, really remunerated in the sense that I see every year teachers and kids who do something remarkable, something that people often think um, is reserved for only the oldest scholars, but that really can be seated beginning in kindergarten and right the way through. I've been really fortunate to have um, conceived of a project and to have won a grant from the E.E. E. Ford Foundation to bring a particular kind of collaborative student-centered project to the Dalton School. And that too, I think, um, I think I was fed in that. I think I had a head start in that because of my experience with graduate work. And so um, every day at this time of year, I'm finishing up hiring a number of students who have their PhDs. I always favor people who um, can be convincing that this isn't their fallback position, but that they actually care about education for kids of all ages. Um, but I, I have found wonderful people, um, find them every year. Hopefully um, some of you are among them, but I do encourage you to keep your mind open, to be flexible, 
and to do a number of different things because I think that allows you to at any moment sit in your position knowing that you've made a choice and that you've made it well.